I'm Stephen John Drew from the official GunnaGeek.com podcast, a proud member of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the one you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out other geeky podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in three, two, one. Happy holidays and welcome to episode 162 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we tie up our annual tradition of closing up the year with our gear talk. This week, it's all about the SP. Yeah, it always is. In this week's Better Podcasting download, we get all touchy-feely as we highlight a Reddit post that all podcasters should hear. And finally, in this week's Better Pod Back, we talk about your 2019 purchase goals. Lauren, start the show now. How much does it cost me for a new co-host? Welcome to Better Podcasting, a show where we talk about podcast tips, tools, and best practices to help you succeed with your podcast. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we podcast purely out of the love and fun of it. Podcasting is our hobby, and we recognize that it's yours too. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. Here's your host for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to episode 162 of Better Podcasting. I am Stephen John Drew, and of course, today I have Stargate Pioneer with me. Stephen, it's our last show of 2018. Let's make it a good one. Absolutely. I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas if you do celebrate that. And SP, I hope things were good for you. Things were indeed good for me. We'll talk about that in the new year. In the meantime, we're going to start off our show like we always start off our shows with a how I saved my podcast story or a how I could have saved my podcast story. And this week's real special. It's a how I could have saved my podcast story. Once again, it is from Reddit. It is from the podcasting subreddit. Posted by U.M. Namdi Nudulator. Wow, so I'll just spell I wouldn't have any idea how to do yeah. that. U-M-N-O-M-E-D-E-U-T-I-L-I-Z-A-D-O-R. So undoubtedly, I butchered it. I'm sorry, but I love your post because your post is any tips on how Audacity can help me fix a conversation that I recorded inside a car. That was the title, and the post was, quote, thank you, unquote. <laughs> so a little information to go off there, but we did recently talk about recording in the car, did we, Stephen? Yeah, and I think the tip that we all settled on, we had a bunch of people participate, was just you go into Audacity, and there's an effects button, and what you do is you go to the drop down, and it says decar. Uh, there's just an effect you applied your whole thing. It's called the decar effect. That's right. It's the deco. Okay. So, no, that's not true. And we talked about a lot of tips on how to do it. First of all, do not podcast and drive and make sure you check out all of the laws in your applicable area. If you're a passenger, you might go ahead and podcast. But if you're driving, I don't know if I would record myself driving and then post it on the internet. Because if you get in an accident, you could be liable for a lot of stuff there. So, that's tip number one. Tip number two, probably want to use some sort of shotgun or dynamic microphone. And if you haven't done that, then if you're using a condenser or a lively Lear, also known as a lapel microphone, you're going to pick up a lot of road noise if you're recording while driving. And that's going to be difficult to get out. I guess you could new- use some a little bit of denoise, but if you use too much, you're going to sound like you're in a fish tank and it's just not going to be good. So I don't... I. I I feel sorry here, but I don't know of any easy button to make this better. No. Uh, yeah. Follow our advice from a couple of weeks ago and all the stuff SP just said there. But really, ultimately, uh, you, you just need to be understanding of the fact that the stuff that you record is what you recorded. And sometimes, as much as you, you try, you cannot polish a turd. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and put that out there right now. I'll call it as it is. I'll call it as it is. Fair enough. But before we move on to our feature segment, we want to remind you that you are lucky because if you were hoping, hoping to send us a goal for 2019, we extended it a couple of weeks because we did a little bit of episode reworking a couple of weeks ago there so that 
we could get a few more submissions than we already have. So thank you to everybody who is submitting. What we want you to do is listen back to a recent episode of yours and pick one thing that you identify as a listener to your own podcast that you want to change within 2019 listening back to your show. This can be audio quality. This can be just a production thing. This could be a variety of different things. Determine one thing that you want to change in 2019 and we'll say it again. I'll throw myself under the bus as much as I have to to get you to give the, us your goal for 2019. This came because I was listening back to the official geek.com show and I heard myself mumbling. I said, Stephen, I don't like that mumbling. You need to enunciate better. And so that was my goal that I picked back listening to my own show. So please send that in to us to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. Please get it in before... January 1st, 2019. Send that to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. Now, Stephen, I think I need to, while we have this opportunity, give you my 2019 goal before it's the first. Okay. And I'm going to say I want to not use so, so much. Ah, that is a good one. Yes. that's a, And it's a crutch word that I use quite oftenly and often. It's a crutch word I use quite often, and I would prefer not to, partly because I hate the syllables in my voice, and I would prefer not to listen to that. And oftentimes, if I just don't say the so, and I run right into what I'm going to say afterwards, it makes total sense. So that's what I'm going to do next year, is reduce the number of so's I say. So on that note, let's go ahead and move on to our featured segment. Just waiting for that, weren't you? This week, we're going to talk about my gear evolution in 2018. If you want to see our complete gear evolution, I would encourage you to go back into the previous year end episodes. We've done this. This is our third year running. We did it last year in 2017. We did it in 2016. I believe we did it in 2015. Actually, I think, Stephen, this is our fourth version of the gear, isn't it? Yeah, because we've been on. Yes, this is our fourth year doing this. So you want to see all our gear evolution. We've done uh, an incredible look all the way back to where we first started podcasting. By the way, for the audio listener, Stephen was kind of nodding his head and shaking it at the same time. So yeah, he can't count. I was putting him on the spot there. But we're going to talk about my gear evolution in the year 2018. We're going to start off with the first one that I got, which was an RE320 filter or the Rode Procaster. Now I got this because I love the Rode Procaster. I love how it sounds. It is an equivalent mic, in my opinion, to the Electro Voice RE320, perhaps a little bit better for some voices. I think it would work for my voice a little bit better if it wasn't for the dang plosives. Mm -hmm. So I did try it extensively at the beginning of this year, but the major flaw is its susceptibility to plosives. And what I started off doing is I used the really big windscreen that goes along with it. And unfortunately, that was not enough to deaden the plosives on it. And I did try different microphone techniques. So it wasn't like I was speaking down the barrel of the thing the whole time. If you're questioning if I did or didn't go back and watch all the videos for the first month or two of this year, you'll see that I was actually using it correctly at a 45 degree angle, about six inches away, four to six inches away. So with the windscreen not working, I decided to try to use a pop filter with it, but the Rode Procaster does not have a dedicated pop filter that would go with it. And I would have to use one of those big, huge pop filters that would obscure my face from the video since we're doing video here on Better Podcasting and Guinea Geek. And I that's where we make that. the money is off of SP's face. Yeah, obviously, as you can really tell this week. So a hack for this is to use the RE320 pop filter, which was sold by BSW USA. It comes in this nice little canister. It's actually the same canister that the pop filter for the RE20 and the RE27 come in. Very similar, but it has different uh, color to it to match the microphone. The problem is it doesn't fit perfectly. And the reason for that is the Procaster body is thicker than the Electro Voice RE320. So the barrel is thicker and then the shock mount doesn't fit. It's too small for the microphone body. So one of the hacks is to get a longer screw and don't hold me to this, but I believe I bought an M3 by 0.5 by 20. So it's 20 millimeters long and it's an M3 size. 
and that screw will enable the pop filter to fit with a little gap in it and it's not a perfect fit i don't know if on the youtube i can actually show this so you can see it but it's not a perfect round fit around the microphone body it is out a little bit from the microphone on like the perfect fit that it is on the electro voice re320 so it's going to be snug it's not going to be a perfect fit but it will work now sadly if you're taking a look at this on youtube you will notice that the distance of the pop filter from the microphone body of the Rode Procaster is a lot shorter than it is over here on the Electro Voice RE320. I can get about two fingers in between the pop filter and the microphone body on the Electro Voice RE320. I can't even get my pinky in the gap between the pop filter and the Rode Procaster. This is going to reduce the effectiveness of the pop filter. And unfortunately for me, with my plosives and the way I speak, I just can't get the Rode Procaster to work with a smaller pop filter. Now, I would love it if Rode or somebody, BSW, b and I don't care who, would come up with a specific pop filter that would work on the Rode Procaster. And it might not just be one pop filter. I've seen dedicated ones that have two pop filters on it that are about a finger's width apart. So you're getting the double of the amount of the explosive mitigation from the pop filter. I think that would be great, but nobody makes one right now. It's a hack to get the RE320 pop filter to work. So it's just not gonna work for me in my application that I have, which is unfortunate because I do like the way the Rode Procaster actually sounds. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that filter definitely, they're missing out by not having one because anybody that's experimented with it knows that a, like a foam windscreen different than a pop filter and there is a bit of a difference in sound and as well visual too. So I, I hope that there is something that comes with it and I appreciate you buying that and doing all of that testing. We got a lot out of that uh, one purchase that you made this past year. Yeah, and it's not cheap. It's like 60 bucks, but we, we did a lot of work with it. Now, the next thing that I acquired, I didn't actually purchase, but we're going to get into why. So over the years, I have used an SD card holder and I use different SD cards along the way, 64 gigabytes for the Zoom H6 that I am recording into. And over the years, I, I bought this particular one for $6.50 on October 16, 2015. So this is three years old and it holds 22 cards. It is full. So for those that are counting, it's averaging just over seven cards per year. And for those that are interested in how much I've invested in the cards, they're about 20 bucks or I wait for them to go on sale for about $20 US for a 64 gigabyte card. So if you just add it all up, it adds up to $440 worth of SD cards over three plus years. So it might sound a lot, but I'm only buying one $20 card every like, other month and it's it's reasonable and i have all the recordings now the sd cards do go bad but i do have all the recordings on these cards i have not overridden them and i don't have to worry about an sd card going bad while i'm using it because generally it takes an overwrite for that to happen so it was full and i was like i gotta order another one well along the same time that i was looking at buying a new one a co-worker at work said oh, wait a minute does anybody need anything that is 3d printed i was like well why is that well i got a 3d printer and i got all this filament and i'm just running out of things to print so what do you guys have that i can go ahead and print and we're all like i don't know he's like okay go to www.thingiverse well it's thingiverse but thing iverse so it's thing with an i and a verse.com and if you see any designs on there that you wanted printed let me know and what did i see I saw a SD card holder and this one is pretty cool. It holds 20 SD cards and it's not, they're not locked in and it's not watertight. I could travel with this if I put like a rubber band around it, but it's not a tight fit. Like it doesn't lock into place, but it does keep dust off of the SD cards. If I'm holding it on my desk, and I didn't have the choice of filament color. He said, you're going to get what you get. And I said, I don't care. That sounds fine with me. As long as it's not hot pink, I'm, I'm fine. And even if it was hot pink, who cares? It's just a SD card holder. But this was free for me. And for him, 
it was pennies because this filament is nothing at all and it was like a seven hour print or something like that for both of these he was able to print it at the same time so score i got a new sd card holder that will last another two two and a half years or so so this is awesome guys it was free and it's a little rough but it's usable i mean he didn't finish it off he didn't sand it or anything but it's great so that was my next thing so road Procaster using the RE320 pop filter and then the SD card holder. Another thing that I tried to add this year, and actually I already had one of these, but I just added this because it had a right angle hook to it, was a 3.5 millimeter splitter. Now, for those of you that have been following Better Podcasting all this year, in the middle of the year, it was announced that Periscope could go ahead and actively stream the audio to Twitter which had not been possible before. So we went ahead and tried it. And what I've got going on is I'm recording to a Zoom H6, which has a 3.5 millimeter line out. Right now I'm using that 3.5 millimeter line out as we record this to go into a very old laptop, which is streaming on Spreaker, which is a secondary media host that I have, would just use it for streaming. And then to keep the file up for the next week or so until it's actually published, and then I take the file down, so it's not the main RSS feed, but I have linked the RSS feed over to Libsyn. Well, in order to use that same audio out, I would either have to go into an audio interface and mix or a mixer and mix the signal in a mix minus out, or just buy this Y cable and go out into my iPad mini two and get audio to Twitter that way. Well, that worked okay. It didn't work great. And for a couple of reasons, first of all, Periscope kept on quitting in the middle of the broadcast. It just quit. I mean, it was great for when it was on, but then it would quit. And the other thing that we had problems using this splitter is that it would go out in one channel or the other, not both channels, which actually confused both of us because it should have been stereo. And it was not getting audio to either Spreaker or the um, Periscope through the iPad mini. So in the end, because of the knockouts, because of the audio problems, I decided to take this out and we haven't streamed to Periscope since, but this was a little added thing that I bought this year and enabled us to talk about Periscope one more time. And I think that's really worth mentioning because of the fact that, you know, it's not something that you had on your radar at the beginning of the year, but there was something that came along and you had to find a solution. So this sort of stuff comes up with podcasting all the time uh, where you do have to just buy a small purchase or maybe a larger purchase if you want to go ahead and adapt to something that is new. And so I think that that, that was a really good mention that you had. And so I appreciate you talking about that and doing that because then I didn't have to invest in it in order to get us going. <laughs> Yeah, it was a major pain. Another thing that I looked into this year was actually stabilization for my smartphone. And what I got was the GGI Osmo Mobile 2. And for those on the YouTube channel, you're looking at the case that I got for it. I'm going to zip open the case. We're going to talk about everything that's in here. And this was a fun thing to have to add to my arsenal this year. Didn't use it a lot for podcasting. I used it for some unboxings and I used it for some of the video that we did. If you're a fan of the Guinea Geek Show, the Christmas special was shot partly on this as well. So what this case allows me to do is not only bring the GGI Mobile 2 along, but all the accessories with it. Now, if you haven't seen a 3D stabilizer before for a cell phone, this is what it looks like. There are a couple other brands. I bought DJI over say Smove, because I'm already familiar with DJI through drone flying and the interface was very similar. So I went ahead with it and DJI knows stabilization from the drones. It's what they're known for actually. So I got that and then I bought a, a tripod. It's a foldable tripod and the tripod's kind of neat because not only can you get one leg of the tripod out, but you actually get two legs of the tripod out. And for those watching on YouTube, you're gonna see me move out the tripods and then underneath the tripod legs, it has extensions. So you can get really stable with this. Unfortunately, it takes up a lot of desk space or ground space when you're using it, which is a bonus if you're using it like outdoors as a tripod, but if you're using it indoors, it can take up excessive amount of space. So what I did is I bought this base for it and you just put the actual DJI 
base into it and you put it on a table and it stands just fine. And this is how most of the Christmas special was filmed as I use this and just put it on a, uh, the, a table and it was looking at me. I did use the tripod as well. It was on the floor and you get the distance, the height by using an extension stick, which is also in the bag as well. So I can go ahead and extend this and I get that extension. The only problem with the extension stick versus a smove is that you don't have any controls on the bottom. So you actually have to go up to the top for the controls. One of the good things, if you're using any sort of logging or YouTube action on your podcast, is it does have face following features or object following features. So if you're doing an unboxing and you're moving around a little bit, this can actually follow you as you're moving. If you look away, if you turn around, if you get out of the field of vision, it's gonna stop following you and then you're gonna have to reset your shot. But it's great for doing what it is. And for the cost of this, am I going to buy a $2,000 DSLR for vlogging right now? No, that's not in the cards. But for $150, that stabilization and uh, a few extra hundred with the case and all the accessories and everything, I've got a pretty sweet mobile platform that I can bring wherever I am. And it's really cool. And one of the things that I get complimented on is I take videos of my daughter's dance team and I do it using the stabilization rig and the dance director slash coach, she will always, if I haven't sent her the videos that I've taken anyway, she will always ask for my videos because they are the best videos out of all of them because of the stabilization factor and because of the processing that DJI adds into the app with my iPhone 8 plus camera. So it's not the most recent iPhone camera, but I get really good video because of those two reasons. So for podcasting, if you're doing any sort of video, if you're doing a convention, if you're doing panels, something like that, this is something that you might want to look into. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that I can think of right away where it might be helpful for podcasters is to do with if you are going to a convention of any form, because I really encourage people, yes, it's good to have the audio, definitely you're a podcaster, but if you're going to use it as a promotional tool, try to get some video because even if you can get that in just something like this, you end up sort of opening the avenues of what you can use to promote that as you can throw it on a Facebook video, you might reach more people. So I think it's worth having something like this if you are going somewhere so that you can have a video companion for that special appearance. You're going to shell out all the money to go to something that's probably pretty expensive, like a convention. Maybe this will help really maximize your reach and your use of that footage. And I did an unboxing of it over on the Gonna Geek Gear channel. I have footage for a review and I'll be putting that footage on. It is drastic between the differences that you can get with a stabilized camera and a non-stabilized camera when you're out looking around and plus the follow features and that sort of thing. Another thing that I got this year, last week, Steven talked about his storage upgrade to four terabytes. And what I did is I upgraded my internal storage from a six terabyte to an eight terabyte on one of my drives. I actually have multiple drives on my computer, but one of the drives has eight terabytes and this is not it. This is not the drive. But for those that don't know what one of these drives look like on the YouTube channel, on the video, on this show, I'm showing a 3.5 inch actual storage drive. Now this one is actually only uh, yeah, half a gig, but it's the same <laughs> half size. A terabyte. Uh, half a terabyte, excuse me. If it was but half it's a gig, I'd be like, where'd you, where'd you get that from, 1992? Uh, no, I got to look. No, it's not an ID3. It's, <laughs> I, I pulled, I, I do have half, half a gig, but not this one. So yes, this is the size, and it's really easy to swap out if you happen to need to swap one out. You need an external plug if you want to copy the data over. Or maybe you have a backup that you can port the data back into it one or the other, but it's really easy to swap these out. So if you need more storage space and you have a desktop, one of these is great. Go ahead and pick one up. Another thing that I had to do this year that I did not want to do, it was not in the upgrade cycle. We talked about it earlier this year. It was my new laptop. You know, I just hated to pull the trigger on it, but my old laptop was so far gone. It wouldn't update anything. I was having hardware issues and software issues. And I just didn't have the time to put in to try to isolate what was wrong with it. 
And even if I did, I didn't know if it was going to work good. So I did try to fix it for a little bit, but after a while, I'm like, okay, fine. I'm just going to get another laptop. The way I've been buying computers lately is I go to Woot and I get one of their refurbished deals. I got a refurbished HP gaming laptop, basically. It had an enhanced video card in it. It had an SSD for a boot drive. And we'll talk about that in a second, but it was much better capability than what I had previously. Uh, could I upgrade what I had if I could get it working? Yes, but this way I knew I had something that I was going to wear and I was traveling at the time and I needed something like within a week to go and I wanted something to make sure that I knew would work and I was going on several different trips. So I'm happy I have it. It's a good laptop and I didn't pay top dollar for it because it's refurbished, but it's been working just great for me. Love that I have it. I just hated that I had to buy it like one year out of cycle. It was like one year too soon. It was like, oh my gosh, that was an unplanned expense. But as we always talk here on Better Podcasting, if you're going to do this for a while, you're going to have to replace your gear at some point. Right, Stephen? Yeah, for sure. And uh, we hope that this sort of stuff doesn't happen to you, but it definitely come can come out of the blue almost as much out of the blue as the headache that SP got with his M2 drive upgrade. That's right. So for those that aren't in the know these days, the solid state drives aren't the little 2.5 inch anymore, although you can get them. Now you have an M.2 drive and these things are great. I'm going to actually pull this out of the package. This is one that I've got saved for an upgrade on another computer and SSDs are cheap now. Oh my gosh. Just a couple of years ago, we, Stephen, we were saying if we get an SSD, a one terabyte SSD under $200, we're pulling the trigger on. Now they're close to, at least with Black Friday deals, to $100 US. And that was just an amazing, it happened so fast this year, just within a couple of months. And the reason I know this is I was in the market for these things when it actually came uh, due, because I upgraded the laptop. The gaming laptop that I had had a really small SSD drive, and it was one of these M.2 drives. And I wanted to upgrade it to a 500 gigabyte drive because I wanted to make sure I had enough operational space on it. And for those on the YouTube channel that have not seen an M.2 drive before, I'm actually holding one in my hands. This is 500 gigabytes. This is the same amount of storage that was on that 3.5 inch drive that I was showing before. Same capability in storage. And it's just amazing how big and how small they are. And I, the, the weight is incredible too with this big magnetic driven drive, disc platter drive. And then this just card is as light as a credit card or maybe lighter. I don't know. I haven't compared the weights. There are some issues with this. We talked about it extensively on the Goody Geek show. You have to make sure that your drive has the specific notches on the top. If you're looking on the YouTube, you'll see two notches in this drive that I'm showing in front of you. And um, they're called M key. And uh, I can't remember a, a N key or it's M key and K key or something. Can't remember what the other key is, but both. Basically, you want both because it's universal and can go in either way. Uh, I bought a drive that did not have the correct key on it. And yeah, that was fun to try to get to work. And when I figured that one out, I was able to return it and get one that did have the correct key. Also, there's two different file formats. Just if you're into this, just pay attention to what you have, what's capable on your computer and what you need, because if you get the wrong one, you're not going to be able to format your drive and look at it, get it to work and stuff like that. So this could be a really big pain or it could be really easy. One of the two. Also, by the way, if you do want to hear more about that, you can head to geeks.link slash 238, which will get, take you to the Gunna Geek Show 238. SP did talk extensively about all of the problems, so it's a really good resource if you are going to do this and live through him. So if you are going to do it, uh, listen to his pain. Yeah, so I'm glad I went through it, but it was... Uh, it was painful at the time, especially since I didn't have a lot of time before I, I needed to leave on my first trip. Another issue that I don't know anything about is long-term reliability. Don't know how reliable these are now because it doesn't have any moving parts. You've got that going for you, but I just don't know about the make uh, and durability of them. Like if you bang them around a little bit or some of these little solder is going to come undone or uh, are you going to bang around the information or something like that? So uh, I, I don't know. And we're going to find out because I've got one now. I've actually got another one in another computer and I'm set to put this in a third computer probably over the break. 
So the next thing that I added to my workflow over the year was Vegas Movie Studio 15.0 Platinum. And I did so on March 8th, but I didn't install it until like June or July <laughs> because I was using 14.0 and it was working just fine. But eventually I decided to, to work with it. I do have the version down from what Steven has. Steven, is it studio that you have? Uh, I have the suite. I have the top one. Yeah, the suite. I have platinum, which is the one down below. And from all we can tell, unless you're doing a heavy video effects, the platinum will work just fine. There's actually the fun thing about it. And I don't know why they packaged it this way is that the suite includes some extra stuff, some extra video effects, some other things in that bundle, but it actually operates off the same core software platinum. So like when I install suite, it's still platinum, but when you tick, pick up the middle tier for some reason you get more transitions more um video transitions in the middle tier than the top tier so you actually have more video transitions than i do and it's just the way that they must figure out their pricing and their bundling and what they pay for third-party transitions and video effects so take a look there's a really good comparison sheet if you are going to possibly pick one of those and um, i would say stay away from the lowest tier though so I've used this extensively for like dance videos or school projects for the kids. Believe it or not, that's when a lot of videos are done these days at all levels from grade school up to college. So it was good to have my video skills intact for this past year. So that was good. And we've used it for going to geek gear videos, unboxings and reviews. And that's at the YouTube channel, going to geek gear. And also for podcasts like Starling Tribune, when I've done the video editing on that, usually Chris does that. Or on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., I use Movie Studio 15.0. Of note, there's been a couple of crashes, like it will stop responding. And it's usually when I've asked it to do about 15 things in about half a second, and it just can't catch back up. So then it becomes an issue of bringing up the auto save version, and sometimes you've lost a little work while doing so. And... There's been some crashes with actual rendering as well, but not, it's, it hasn't been as bad for me as it has been for Steven. You know, I, I would agree with you. I actually think that 15 is less stable than 14. With that said, um, I still will take 15 over 14 from the render capability that I talked about last week, just the hardware encoding. You know, I drastically save time with the hardware encoding versus not having it. So it's worth it to me. But uh, I'm hoping that this year, when they bring 16 out, they fix some of those because they have made it better since the beginning. But in my opinion, 14 was was more stable. Also, if you want to see how I use it, you can go to a YouTube channel that I've set up for my video editing walkthroughs. They're not instructionals, they're walkthroughs. And that's Stargate Pioneer Edit Walkthroughs. That's the name of the YouTube channel, Stargate Pioneer Edit Walkthroughs. And I should be getting back on those videos within the next week here. So another purchase that I did or another upgrade that I did, and before I talk about that upgrade, let me backtrack into, you just talked about Movie Studio 16.0. Once you actually enter into this architecture, when they upgrade, you can get the upgrade for a much reduced price. So that it keeps you on their platform, but yet you give them a little bit money for the development, but you don't have to go back to the beginning and pay like $150 for the suite or 120 for platinum or something like that. It's greatly reduced. So it's good to get in on a sale and then upgrade when you get the deals. The next deal that I did for upgrading was Isotope RX7 elements. And I did so above uh, Isotope RX5. And it was kind of sweet how that deal went. It was at the tail end of RX6. I had not upgraded to RX6. And they said, Go ahead, buy RX-6, and then when 7 comes out, like next month, you'll get an automatic upgrade. And that's exactly what happened. So I've bypassed 6 completely. I went from RX-5 to RX-7. I did have a slight issue activating, and it probably had to do with I skipped a generation there. But Isotope was quick to respond once they got back to work, because I tried to activate it on a weekend. So it took until like Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning before they were able to respond. But they did. They gave me a new activation code. They probably had to go in and figure out what had happened in in. I'm pretty sure what happened is I skipped a generation and they were like, eh, that's probably why your activation code doesn't work. I'm still working through the settings for RX-7 and I still use RX-5 if I'm in a pinch and want to make sure it works the first time. Mainly the two out of the four uh, effects that I use is denoise and declick. I use declick all the time on my own voice. There's just 
artifacts out of my mouth that D-Click helps take out. And D-Noise is the noise reduction that I use, and it works great. And it is definitely worth it if you don't already have it, especially if you have a audio, a more professional-based audio editor that'll run the effects as you are previewing and as you are rendering all at once. And as I mentioned, there's sales a few times a year. I mean, if you're in a pinch and you don't want to buy at full price, you can definitely get sales. It does happen multiple times during the year. And the best deal you're going to get is going to be Black Friday or Cyber Monday or somewhere around the holiday shopping, but you will get deals throughout the year for it as well. If you don't already have the RX suite, I would go ahead and investigate it and you'll love it if you're actually looking into increasing your audio production, even of your videos as you go along, because these effects are great to use. And do you own the elements or did you go to the next tier up? Nope, I just uh, elements. The next tier up I've been thinking about doing and every time I think about doing it, I have some sort of financial emergency and I just don't have the what, what, 100 $150. I five you and me both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to just haven't gotten there yet. Another thing that I bought and Steven kind of negated this in his talk last week, but I, I bought it this year. So we're going to talk about it. I bought the Avermedia video capture device and this thing's a 4k video capture device. I've had awesome luck with it. I have video captured different things just to try it out, but it was supposed to be a backup recorder for podcasts and video, but I just, I don't need, I haven't found a need to need it with my workflow. Yes. There's been a couple of times that I've forgotten to hit record like on OBS studio, but I've been able to recover and video isn't for my productions. It isn't the prime way to distribute the content. So I'm not too worried about a degraded audio that goes out. And by degraded, I mean like less elements that are used with, you know, no templates and like, the, the fun stuff that Steven has put together for better podcasting here that makes it look so great. If I don't have it, you know, it's not the end of the world. I would prefer to have it, but yeah. So I haven't used this for podcasting yet. And NDI, as long as I get more bandwidth in here, NDI is going to make this path less likely for me to have to go down to get multiple versions of these to capture everybody's video. Another thing that I did this year that's not really a gear enhancement, but is something that I've been promising for a few years is I actually put together my audio diagram, my audio chain <laughs> diagram. And this took a lot longer than I had wanted to. First of all, I had to make sure I had mapped everything correctly, but then it took a lot longer to put it in because I do have a quasi complex setup for a hobby podcaster. And a lot of people over the years have asked for that. And one of the things that I was able to do was I put it on Twitter. So it's available on my Twitter feed at Stargate Pioneer. But Steven has set up a short link, actually a couple of short links to it. And if you're wanting to see my audio chain and you just missed it throughout the year, or maybe you're new to better podcasting, you can go to geeks.link slash SP diagram 2018 or geeks.link slash SPs with an S diagram 2018. And you will see what my audio diagram was when I sent it out. Now, when I did send that out, one of the things that you'll see on there is I do have the Periscope capability linked in there. We're not using that Periscope capability anymore just because of the issues that we had with it. But you can see how I set it up so that I could have multiple live audio streams going out. So that is a little less than previous years. And that is because the drone had, flying, oh, drone yeah. flying is what happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that happened. We'll <laughs> talk about that in a second. Uh, one of the things that I had a lot of emergencies this year and it was just abnormal, you know, usually in your life, you plan for like one major emergency or maybe two minor emergencies, something like that. I had five major emergencies happen in this year and we won't get into depth in all of them one of the ones that i wanted to bring up though was the hurricane that hit the carolinas my son goes to school full-time in north carolina he actually lives in wilmington and he was hit bare on by hurricane florence in september of 2018. he evacuated a week before the storm i mean the area was great they saw this cat 5 hurricane coming at him and they started shutting down a week before so he got out of Dodge really quickly. And he stayed here for four weeks while Wilmington, North Carolina 
got its feet back underneath him. And this was not just a nicety, it was a necessity because food deliveries to the area were hampered. I No major roadway was working for weeks afterwards. And he was going to be taking I-40 into town. And, and that was just a mess for about 40 miles. So there was costs associated with this. You know, I had to get him up here, had to maintain him up here. And when he went back, he needed a few extra things. But we did get a neat thing that happened that's podcasted related. And I wanted to make sure we talked about this. And it was because I actually had a secondary use for my microphone. And for the um, video users, why don't you go ahead and take a look at your YouTube and you'll see what my microphone was actually being used for. That little parakeet, that little dude, his name was Nibbler, and he's awesome. By the end of the three weeks, he didn't like me very much, and I did nothing to him. I wasn't mean to him or anything, but I just don't think he wanted to be here. I think he wanted to be back home, but I did let him hang out in the podcast studio, and actually, uh, because of this, whenever he was in the great room, which is right outside the door there, he would fly, and he would want to get on the microphone. So the microphone became his home away from home. Oh, a bird mic. If you didn't gather, that's what it was. There's a picture of his RE320 with a bird sitting on it. He has an RE320 with a bird sitting on it. So a uh, little dirtier mic than he used to have, but you know what? It is what it is. We're going to talk about mic sanitation next year. It's going to be a segment that I do. And yeah, I did clean the microphone after the bird was around here. I do want to say that I, I, I'm going to call BS right now on your whole, you know, it costs you extra expenses because we had your son come on the gunnageek.com show when he was evacuated and that sent our ratings up, which meant that your paycheck check went like four or five times as much as it usually is over there. Zero times five is still zero, Stephen. Oh, okay, darn. Yeah. <laughs> So another reason besides the emergencies that I didn't have to buy a lot of gear this year is the podcast gear that we've invested in. It's built to last. Will it last forever? No, but I didn't need too many replacements this year. I guess the biggest replacement would probably have been the laptop as an emergency replacement, but everything else is good quality equipment. It's dialed in right and minimal tweaking required from week to week or month to month. So for that, what we've put in place is is pretty good and it's been working just fine. Also, I did add a couple of new hobbies this year. As Steven was saying before, drone flying was definitely one of the things that came into my life. I love my drone. And for the audio listener, Steven is holding up his very cheap Star Destroyer drone and I'm holding up my Mavic Pro drone right now. Uh, yes, I would prefer to have a Mavic Pro 2 right now, but I don't. I just have the Mavic Pro. And it's fun to fly. As a matter of fact, we're going to get to do some authorized night flying in about a week. That's going to be really fun. And I'll talk about that later on a Gunna Geek show. Uh, but another thing that I added, again, for those listeners of Gunna Geek, is I added an outdoor theater. And it didn't cost all that much. And it was just great to use with the family. I still have the family here. And again, for those that don't know, I'm getting older. The kids are getting older. They're graduating from college and moving on with their lives. So we're just trying to do some fun things with them while they're still in the house, which I think I'm going to lose one in about a month or two. So yay and sad all at the same time. But that's all the reasons why there wasn't extensive gear purchases in 2018. Well, thank you very much for going through that today. I think that uh, you covered a lot of good information as far as what you purchased, why you purchased it, what you didn't purchase and why you didn't purchase it. And I hope that this helps you, the listener and viewer, get an idea of what you might want to purchase, what you might want to avoid, and that it doesn't all happen at once. We said it last week. We'll say it again this week. If you're wanting to buy something, think it through. Does it make sense? Will you get a benefit? And know that you don't have to do it all at one time. That's the idea behind these episodes that you can hear that we don't just go out and buy willy nilly, generally speaking. <laughs> but let's go ahead and move on to the better podcasting download. Welcome to this week's better podcasting download. All right, this is a really 
fun Reddit post that SP went and shared with me today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to SP to talk about this while I go and set up a short link. <laughs> so this was a post that was on the podcasting subreddit. It was posted by Dedis Titan. And the title was, you just haven't found your audience yet. And we thought this was a great way to end 2018 with, and you're going to hear why in just a second. Here's the post quote. This is to the new podcasters, to the old guard, still waiting for luck to be on their side and everyone in between. I'm sorry that you don't feel appreciated. You put a lot of thought into what you want to talk about when you record, how you want to make waves and be different in an ocean of similar people. You don't always get to determine when people will see that side of you or what you make. It can be a little painful when you make something for other people when no one seems to care. So maybe that's made you a little inconsistent. The joy that came with recording by yourself or with other people started to feel like a chore. It happens. You understood this could be the outcome, but you didn't think it was going to happen to you. The mountain of confidence that you once had has been chipped away at, but don't they make monuments in the same way? Don't see the low downloads as a source of failure. Reject the voice in your head telling you to quit. Fight back against whatever cruel tricks the world seems to be using against you. There is not a single person who would ever get in front of a microphone, bare their soul, and release that creation to the world if they didn't believe they could do it. What would be the point in ever starting if you didn't think you could be you could in the first place? Weren't you excited when you first bought your equipment? Didn't you dream of doing something great? Hold on to that feeling and use it. Low interaction, no iTunes reviews, disinterested friends, whatever. Put that all aside and make the podcast just like how you imagined it would be. I'm still a nobody with less than a thousand downloads in nine months. If you choose to think that all this text is just encouraging words with nothing to back it up, then you're right. But maybe that's just what somebody needs right now. Maybe that's what you need before you think about giving up. You aren't bad at this. You just haven't found your audience yet. Unquote. I love this. It's so good. Like we talked about how podcasting can be tough and sometimes just knowing that it's okay. Uh, that, you know, there are going to be low points. Know that that's part of the process might get you over that to the next point. So I'm so glad that SP, you found this. And, you know, I said at the top of the show, it's all touchy feely, you know, it's a touchy feely article. And so I'm going to go ahead and burn a short link right now with geeks.link slash we love you. There you go. It's geeks.link slash we love you. We'll just continue on that sappy, sappy train there. And if you like this post, please go over to Reddit and tell them that you like that, because I think that this is the sort of thing, the positive encouragement that we sometimes lack in the podcasting space. And as long as you know, there will be difficult points, you know, keep on, keep on trying to get through it. And you know, if it's not for you, it's not for you. And you know, I, I'm not going to say that podcasting is for everybody, but sometimes it just has to be to just get to that next point and know that someone else might be in the same situation as you. And dead as Titan nine months in, you just made a really impactful post. There's already some responses there. I won't go through them. I'll go over to the short link and read them, but there are a lot of people that are saying, thank you. This meant a lot to me right now. So if you're one of those people, please tell Dennis Titan that thank you very much for posting that and get some encouragement for those words and get out there and continue your podcast in 2019 and continue to make the waves. Even they might be small to you, but continue to make the waves over time. They will build up. Well, thank you very much for finding that. I know I just said that, but I want to say it again because it is a really, really good post. But let's go ahead and move on to our better pod back. I feel like I shortchanged you there, SPA. When I turned it over to you to read that, I forgot to call you our resident reader. That's your official title now here. A resident yeah, I'm reader. Still, still waiting for the new business cards with that title on it. Fair enough. Well, today we are going to continue on our gear related ish uh, discussion that we have in our better pod back. We had a whole bunch of stuff last week. If you missed that, please go back and check that out. There's a lot of people talking about their highlights and their lowlights 
of their purchases. Well, today we are turning it over to you to tell us what your one purchase was that you have your eye on related to your podcast for 2019. We got quite a bit of feedback on this as well. So let's go ahead and read through that. Damien, the DM said Zoom L12, hoping to get some cash to save for it before Christmas or between Christmas money, birthday money and work bonuses, hopefully by early March. I got to say, I really like the L12. Yes, there are things about the L20. If you haven't checked that out, that are better. Um, but the L12 is great. If it, if the features that it has, the inputs it has is enough for you. I, I really like the L12. I've been really, really happy with it. And it just has simplified my setup so much. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I was going to choose one, I mean, we'll talk about it later, but the L20 is definitely up on my list of things. So the L12 just doesn't have enough inputs for me in the studio, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, Josh Liston said, I wish I could for afford a yellow tech boom arm, but I just can't justify spending that kind of cash on a boom. So my eye is now set on a second high L PL2T boom arm, which is very nice. Both Steven and I actually use one. Absolutely. We also had Bangs Naughty Bits say, I'm already living the dream. Maybe a new shock mount for the fridge. Well, he said in the chat tonight that he's shock mounted the fridge already. So I think, I, I don't know if he's saying he needs like a new one or he needs a replacement shock mount for the fridge. I'm not sure. 2019. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm sure about that. Pretty sure it means that he's recording in his fridge. I think that's what that means. As long as it's not locked, it might be very well acoustically uh, tuned to his voice. I'm going to go with no with all the plastic. We also had <laughs> Zachary Webb say a studio video kit, but more specifically for audio, a uh, Behringer Q1202 USB mixer for using multiple XLR microphones with physical mixing. Of course, the Dell XPS 15 is also tempting, but dollar, dollar, dollar. Yeah, uh, the computers are definitely something that you have to, as we talked about before, you have to actually get something that's going to work for what you need your capabilities to. But in the meantime, use what you got and just work within those limitations. On Twitter, at Jonathan Bloom responded to us and he said, palette gear audio control knobs for editing. Yeah, and there was a good conversation that happened in that. So go ahead and look that up. That's twitter.com slash Jonathan Bloom, J O N. A-T-H-A-N-B-L-O-O-M. Over at Geeks.Live, we have Mike Dell saying that he's looking for a replacement to his new mixer, replacing the Mackie 1202. Back on Twitter, at the Poet God said, another microphone. Which is a lot of common thing, I think, for podcasters as they expand. Uh, a lot of people do want to try things out. I will say this, I've tried a plethora of microphones and don't feel you have to because there are differences between microphones. If you find one that you think sounds good with your voice, if you are debating between a different microphone and something that might work differently within your setup and might make your life a little bit easier, go with the non-microphone thing because just be happy with how you sound and you might not need that extra few percent until it's a year or two later. At Region Racing responded on Twitter, Rode PSA1 instead of using a cheap boom arm, something that just works well. Now, we do actually use the High LPL 2T, and we have had issues with the Rode PSA1 making squeaking noises. We do have friends and associates that use the Rode PSA1 and don't have an issue with it. And it is a very good shock uh, or a boom arm for the microphone, and it does actually have a superior mounting apparatus for the edge of a table on it over the high LPL 2T, I use the actual um, mounted version with screws. So Steven actually has his Rode PSA-1. No, I don't have my PSA-1. What it is, is it's a generic nearer uh, one. Yeah. And what I wanted to bring up was that I have a couple of generic ones that I picked up just for the random thing where I need a second microphone, you know, if it's something with the kids. And there's a couple of things that are really important to note is that the better quality microphone arms, I find definitely compared to the ones that I've tried, they will hold more weight. The cheaper mm -hmm. ones will start to slouch as well. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's a lot of clang and other stuff with the cheaper ones that you don't generally get with the uh, more expensive arms. I think it's worth going a little bit higher eventually, but 
if you can get yourself a cheap one that works for your workflow and works for your microphone, it's better than not having one, in my opinion. Also on Twitter, dadio at dadio underscore Ryan or dadio underscore Ryan, as we're now calling them on the Guinea Geek Network, <laughs> said microphone upgrades are in the works. And this is on the tail end of being called out of using a Yeti by the Yeti Hunter. So, yeah, I think I'm looking forward to their gear upgrades in the future. And if you haven't checked out a great podcast about two dads that are fostering as well as bringing up their own kids in a modern world, the Dad IO podcast is an excellent podcast to listen to. Agreed. They're awesome. And I'm really happy to have them on the network. That's all the feedback we got related to our question, but we did get one other piece of feedback that we wanted to go ahead and go through right now. Now, here's the thing is it came from Johnny Pennington and what Johnny Pennington doesn't really realize, and we'll get there, is that it's a very, very complimentary email. And I'm not joking. I'm not being sarcastic, Stephen. Uh, we will get to that. But first, let's turn it over to resident reader, Stargate Pioneer. Once again, this is from Johnny Pennington. Quote, hey, guys, I don't know if this fits in with your gear show, but it is something that you do and how you do it that I would like to see. I'm sure others would be interested in this also. Often, one of you will pick up from the other on the same question or email as you are reading it without skipping a beat. I don't believe that you are using teleprompters, but what you use and how you utilize it would be great to see. Maybe some still photos of any apparatus you are using or an actual video while you are doing it would also be helpful. Thanks for providing another great year of better podcasting. And I, like many others, am looking forward to your next 12 years, like any good scotch, Johnny Pennington. 12 years, that's far too much of a commitment, so I'm not going to go ahead and do that. Uh, but thank you, Johnny, for writing. What we do here in order to pass it back and forth without missing a beat is actually quite simple. We actually hire two directors, and they're in constant contact. And they're chatting back and forth. I have one right behind my camera right now. And she's talking to the one over at Stargate Pioneers. And so that's really how we coordinate it. Just back and forth is we, we have directors. Yeah, we do. And they work for peanuts too, <laughs> which is really great. Uh, Johnny, this is an incredible uh, compliment to us because no, we don't script out how we interface at all. We do use show notes, but at any one time, either Stephen or I could pick up a section in the show notes and we move forward with that or we'll comment on a section in the show notes. And that stuff is not scripted at all. And it just is a natural back and forth. I will say having two people on a show versus three people on the show is a little bit easier because when you're interrupting or injecting yourself, you kind of feel that from the other person, from the visual cues, since we are a video show or from the audio cues. I have a way of ending my stuff that Steven picks up and Steven has a way of ending his talk that I pick right up or I raise my hand or I, I give some sort of cue that I want to energize. And we try not to overspeak. Sometimes we do, but we try not to. And it's just because we've developed this way to work back and forth. And no, it's not scripted. And that's what the compliment is. So thank you very much. This is just us working back and forth like a well-oiled machine. And that is saying something because neither of us are well-oiled. Yeah. And when we do our notes together, what we do is we do use Google Docs. Uh, we've actually talked about it. We had an episode or two dedicated to it. And we go in and we do put our notes together of what we want to talk about. And sometimes it's bullet points, sometimes it's full sentences. And we just work off of that. And we've got to know each other's formulas, what works best for each other and sort of how we like to work. And so then we do have that access to that doc while we're recording so that if we do pass it over to somebody else, like SP said, we're ready to go. We're both following the doc at the same time. So I think that this sort of is an example on how you got to feel it with your co-host. And if you don't feel it with your co-host, you might be making the process more difficult for yourself. And I feel really honored to podcast with SP. It's really, really easy for us to bounce off each other from week to week. And I really, really do appreciate everything that SP does to pick up when I do make mistakes because it happens. And I, again, I'm just really, really honored to to have a good co-host like SP. And I'm honored as well to co-host with Stephen. What you guys don't see off air is there isn't a lot of stuff that we do throughout the week that we go through both with Gonna Geek and, and 
better podcasting, but more so with better podcasting since there's only two of us. And the same sort of things that you see on air, we work as well off air. And we're talking about who's going to do the show notes, what topics should we pick, you know, what, what should we do for the download and that sort of thing. We actually work back and forth on that quite well. And we just come together and get the show done. Like if somebody's busy on a week, the other person will take over everything. And then the other person will come in that has done none of the prep and be able to podcast just because of the way that we set everything up. It's plug and play that the other person can do the same thing the next week of preparing everything, or we can both be in the document at the same time. We've done that as well. And we've done, it's kind of funny when we're both typing in the document, somebody will take lead and the other person will just there and sit and wait for the other person to pause and then jump right in. So it's worked well, even off air and that sort of working back and forth, it happens few and far between, I guess, or you need to get to that point with your co-hosts in order to have an effective show. And once again, we have a little bit easier task because we're a video podcast and we see those video cues. If you're using Discord, for example, and you only have the audio, that is an issue where you don't know that somebody else wants to come in and speak and you end up with overspeak as well. So that's just another plug, I guess, for moving to that video, at least for your recording. So you can see each other when you're talking. Now, for instance, if Stephen and I were doing a podcast with Josh Liston, there's no way that we could do that with video. And the reason why is we're going across a continent that might not have the bandwidth to really take what we need at the quality level that we do. So maybe Josh would be audio only and so that we wouldn't get that video. But sometimes, most of the time, you're talking to somebody that's relatively close in your area in the same continent like Stephen and I are, even though we're cross country. I will say that from time to time, we do want to say a specific point and communication is key for that. Yes, we will mark it in the doc, but we do always have a conversation ahead of time because of the fact that we want to make sure that as we get there, we sort of recognize in our mind that we're we're supposed to turn it over to the other point. It doesn't happen often, but there are some times that we want to make sure that so somebody says one of the elements specifically. And sometimes it's just to do with our passion on it. Sometimes it's to do with other optics, but we definitely want to make sure that we do communicate that ahead of time. And we do that in addition to marking it on the dock, but that's rare. rare. Yeah. So the communication takes place visually through what we're doing right now on the video. It takes place in the dock itself. If we have to throw a note in the dock, actually change a note in the dock or put a comment in the dock, one of the two that does it. We're also in the live chat. Sometimes we'll cue each other in the live chat, although we try not to do that sort of thing publicly in the chat. And also we have a private IM that we're working off as well. So we kind of have to pay attention to all of that as we're going. And then if Steven is actually broadcasting on Facebook, he's got to take a look at the Facebook chat as it's going as well. So it gets kind of complicated for Steven, but he's an accomplished video prod, prod, uh, producer and way better than me at it. And it's because of his just inherent capabilities to do all that, that he's able to do it. So anyway, just want to say thank you very much, Stephen. It's an honor podcasting with you. And Johnny, thank you very much for the email because that was a big compliment and you didn't even know it. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the kind words and thanks to everybody who's made our year a success. This is it for better podcasting for 2018. So for episode number 162, the last of 2018, I'm Stephen John Drew saying I hope you have yourself a wonderful new year and we hope to hear back about all of the awesome things that happened to you at the beginning of the year. And I'm SP saying thank you everybody for downloading, for listening to Better Podcasting. We really appreciate that and we'll see you in 2019. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Better Podcasting. We want to hear from you. You can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. If you like the show, please consider giving us a five-star review in iTunes. We encourage you to check out all of the other geeky podcasts available at gunnageeknetwork.com. This has been a Gunna Geek production. Thanks for listening, and we will see you again next week.